crazy. There's a phrase out there, right? Drinking water from fire hose. That's me. Uh, yeah, I'm learning a lot, a lot. Went through budget discussion for the first time, so understanding what all that looks like and means is, is scary and daunting and uh, fluctuating. Process of having the team here, I think that's when things started to feel real. Um, getting a chance to speak to the players, getting a chance to speak to the entire staff, getting a chance to speak to the academy staff, the Monarchs coaching staff, and the majority of the Monarchs players. Um, it's all been really good. Yeah, just trying to set the tone. We've talked a little bit about identity and culture. Those, those have been, I would say, my high points so far. You obviously had a lot of um, experiences and positions since you left Utah. Um, how would you say that the Jason that we see before us today is different from the Jason that, that left in 2013? We don't have enough time to answer that <laughs> question. Um, it really is probably could write a book on it, to be honest. Um, learned a lot, a whole lot of things about different ownership um, structures to management styles to dealing with players um, with massive, massive names, um, world legends of the game. Um, so all of that stuff. And then, you know, experiences with national teams, uh, understanding uh, all sorts of different tactics. Um, and then, you know, in Miami, starting an academy, so being the youth side of it, uh, working with the U23 team for the national team, working with the second team for Inter Miami for a year. So we just had so many experiences in the game that I think I just, uh, I guess the simplest way to say it was a much more rounded person and educated person in all facets of the game. Um, Jason, we heard the other day from Pablo, Anthony, Nate, um, they all use the word alignment and collaboration quite a bit. I feel like that's probably a little bit of a reflection on some of the work you've been doing. Um, how would you describe the pyramid, if you will, from Academy, Monarchs, First Team, and, and how it all fits together? Yeah, first of all, you have to talk about ownership, right? That's where it starts, um, in my opinion. It starts with ownership to then management front office people like Kurt, Tony, and myself. Moving down to coaching staffs, uh, you know, the coaching staff for the first team, to all of the soccer staff that's involved with the first team, to then the staff that's in the, uh, sorry, the Monarchs and the Academy side, which call, we're calling that the development side right now. To then, yeah, all of the players as well. That's what that I think about as alignment, just a leadership alignment structure, and that we all have the same core values, same vision, same identity. Uh, when we get start to the soccer side now, I think it's become even more, a little bit more defined, and more opportunity there to talk about alignment from a soccer style point of view, um, from a game model, from a methodology side, that we're all talking the same language. There's, there's a lot of words in this game. We need to be using the same ones. We need to be having the, the same ideas about how we view our game model, what we want to do in the games, and then tactics to find the final pieces, how we want to develop the players. Uh, and we're moving in that direction. It's, it's not going to be a simple process. There's just so much to get through um, that I think it's going to take time. But I, I would say I'm very, very pleased with, with the initial um, sort of first month, first couple of weeks, I guess, actually now. Feels like we're moving in a new direction. Are you able to kind of naturally liaise between those two sides in turn? I mean, I guess kind of building off of that alignment, just because of your role working with the business side, but also your experience and technical staffs and coaching and that kind of thing. Are you on? I mean, I feel like you're almost a natural kind of liaison between those two departments, even if it's not necessarily intentional. Yeah, yeah. You should have been in my interview to get this job. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that was a um, what I thought would be a big selling point the fact that I've been a professional player and obviously was a youth player in this country, developed through this country, college player, and then moved to the coaching side, I've been an assistant coach, I've been an academy director, I've kind of worn all the hats necessary to, I think, be empathetic to people and mm -hmm. to support them in a really positive way, in a really meaningful way. Um, and I looked at this opportunity and said, I'd, I'd like to go about this in, in this sort of role go about the leadership role in a different way, in a way that maybe I haven't experienced in, in my coaching career, and offer a different sort of voice, and a different sort of ear to hear these people and to help support them. It kind of feels like the player at the center of, of all this discussion, RSL especially right now, is Diego Luna. 
Um, we're talking about a young player, someone who's kind of come up through the developmental side. And then I'm curious with your experience, having worked with you know a lot of U23 players at national level, what do you what do you see from from Diego, and kind of how does he um, represent maybe it, the things that RSL is trying to do right now? Yeah, I think any time that I think about the player, uh, I like to think first and foremost about the person. Um, and everything that I've heard, I haven't even actually had a real conversation with Diego yet because he just now got back a couple of days ago. But everything I've heard is that this is a really quality person. Uh, this is somebody that, that does represent the, the values that we have at this club about you know hard work, uh, an idea that you know you, you have to earn the things that you're giving, you have to earn your opportunities. I think last year he came in as a brand new player, and Pablo did a really nice job of essentially making him wait and making him work extremely hard to get the opportunity, such that when you do that and you put a player in a position like that, oftentimes what you'll see is now you're bringing out the best of them. And when you are giving them an opportunity, they've earned it and they're ready for it. Um, and so those are the things that I really like about, about Diego. Um, I think it's also important, you know, I'll be the guy in the room to say, let's all just slow our roll a little bit, right? Because this is now a second year um, player in, in the top professional league. Oftentimes there's going to be a little bit of a step back. Now I'm not saying that there will be, but I think we should be prepared and ready for it and feel like it's okay um, because this is a very young player that has a bright, bright future in front of him. And if we put too much weight on the player, then we could end up hurting him, which in turn hurts ourselves. I guess kind of along a parallel path or maybe uh, a few years removed is Fidel Barajas. Mm -hmm. What what has you and the staff? Um, both the technical staff and the front office, kind of excited about that potential. Yeah, I mean, what you see with Fidel is some of the similar qualities because you have this very young player who's had some extreme success in the championship um, and has attacking abilities and qualities, but he's still willing to work extremely hard. Uh, and that's the thing that oftentimes, you see it more often than not in young attacking-minded players, that they're skillful, they have talent, they you know can make things happen when they have the ball, but oftentimes when the ball turns over, then they think their work is done. What I really was impressed with Fidel about is to, you know, it's one thing to see the, the goals and assists and great services that he makes and all of his abilities. But what I was impressed more so than anything else about was when the ball turned over, this guy was sprinting back to help his team defend. And those are the types of qualities that Pablo places, places an extreme amount of value in and this club really appreciates and will need if we hope to succeed. Okay. You talked a lot about development and kind of your role working with the development group and the senior team and all that. As you're kind of building up that, everybody thinks of building up the development side like vertically from bottom up or top down, whatever it is. Yeah. Is there also a way to maybe kind of build it out laterally in some ways where utilizing maybe other leagues like the championship or, or that kind of thing to, to identify talent and be able to bring them into, into an umbrella there? Is that also sort yeah. of a yeah, I mean, I development think it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, if just look at the Fidel signing and if you look at the Diego signing last year right. if you look at back at even like Luke Mulholland before him when Johnny Steele I mean this is a club that's always done I think a really nice job of looking down in those lower leagues and saying where can we get where can we get value here where can we grab some guys that that are going to be hungry that are going to be you know a little bit less expensive and go and sign for an international players um, so I think it's been a club that's always been very smart about that then you add on the layer about college players some of the contributions that this group got last year from the college players was, I think, second to none, fantastic, and we're hopeful that we can continue doing that. So when we talk about development, we're not just talking about the academy, we're also sure. talking about developing young players, right? I don't think it's going to be our ambition to go out and sign 30-year-old uh, USL championship players, but if we can find young players that we can, we can work with and develop, that's going to be a, a major part of our focus.